Hello everyone. What I'd like to show you all today is a method to rapidly prototype a phased array beamformer. What we'll build right now in this video is a 16 channel 4x4 array at 10 gigahertz. But you could easily use the same hardware for anything between 8 and 16 gigahertz and even bolt a new antenna to it with the lattice spacing uh, that you want for, for the frequency that you want. So if that sounds interesting, then stay tuned and we will walk through the entire process. Everything from the very basics and setup into creating some very beautiful 3D graphs in Python. But before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is John Kraft. I'm a field apps engineer for analog devices in Colorado. Uh, and let me just offer the caveat that even though I work for analog devices, uh, everything we're gonna talk about here, these are my own thoughts and tips and advice on, on this YouTube channel, uh, purely my own opinion. So uh, proceed at your own risk. Right now, all things related to phased array beamforming are in great demand. Uh, we're seeing beamformers used in military and commercial radars, in satellite communications, in automotive applications, and new 5G millimeter wave systems. I've done an overview video in the past that might be fun for you. That link is below. It goes through some of the basic operations of a beamformer and then concepts like what is tapering, what is beam squint, or grading lobes. And then we do a simple setup where you can actually experience hands-on each of those concepts. Uh, and it concludes with some fun monopulse tracking operations. But what can be particularly challenging is how do we prototype a phased array beamformer? And we, for this, we really don't have a ton of options. And so generally, we just string together a bunch of eval boards and development systems, and then spend a long time trying to get them all to talk to each other. And even then, the performance of this rat's nest of eval boards is not going to be the same as the final product. You've got isolation and crosstalk, and, and connectorized filters are going to behave differently. So it's a real challenge uh, without spending many months and lots of money uh, to do this. So about a year ago, John Richardson at X-Microwave and I talked about making a rapid prototyping phased array development system. Uh, and if you've watched my other videos, you know I'm a big fan of the good people at X-Microwave and, and the great products that they do. And what they came up with for phased array prototype, prototyping is very cool. Uh, it's both high performance and it's very flexible. So this video is going to show you that, uh, but more than just telling you about it, I'll walk you through the entire setup. And with this hardware and software setup, you could literally be doing your own beamforming work as quickly as tomorrow. It's very cool stuff. Um, so here's what, what I'd like to talk about. First, let me give you a quick overview of the X microwave system and what my experience has been with it. And as part of that, I'll introduce their phased array cube uh, and how that looks. Then I'll give you a simple test setup for doing some beamforming experiments. It will consist of a mixer, a Pluto SDR, and a Raspberry Pi. The next step is understanding how to program the ADR1000. And for that, we'll use ADI's Pi ADI IAO Python library. This is a very slick library that makes it easy to organize and control one beamformer or many, many beamformers. And then finally, we'll write a simple Python script and uh, we'll make some pretty pictures of the beam. So first up, let's talk about the X-Microwave system. If you have not seen their stuff before, it is very interesting to check out. They have this uh, cool low insertion loss, uh, very clean interconnect system that gives you great RF breadboarding up to 67 gigahertz. M many manufacturers are included in their system, but the largest portfolio is from analog devices. Uh, over 400 unique ADI parts are in their library, uh, amplifiers and mixers, synthesizers, DSA switches, um, all, all kinds of RF parts. But there are many other RF component makers in their system as well. Uh, and these provide uh, filters and couplers and splitters and references um, to really give a whole flushed out ecosystem. Uh, the great thing about this system is, is power and data comes up from underneath uh, the board, and that gives you a, a very clean, pristine RF path uh, on the top side of the board. So you can take something like on the left side, uh, which is probably not unfamiliar to, to many of us on our benches, uh, a bit of a rat's nest of, of cables and eval boards and connectorized modules, and you can convert it into something um, in, into the X-Microwave system. And, and these are shot for shot remakes here. The, uh, the, the uh, picture on the right is exactly uh, what the picture on the left is, but you can imagine that on the right is, is a much more representative to what your final prototype or final design is going to look like. And selecting the components and building the entire system is very easy too. They have a great layout tool where you just drag and drop the blocks that you want. And then at the end, it generates a complete bomb uh, that you send to X microwave. And then when you get their components, uh, they just bolt down to the solid copper protoboard. 
uh, and you can add SMA launches and then wire uh, power and digital comms into the backside. So this is what the ADR1000 X microwave module looks like. It is a combination of the ADR1000 board, but as well as four ADTR1107s. And each ADTR1107 is a PA, a half watt PA, it's an LNA uh, and a switch combined together. And then finally, uh, what we call the phased array cube is, is a sandwich of four of these ADR1000 modules uh, connected together. And, um, and then you can bolt an antenna onto them. And here's what the phased array cube looks like in, in real life, just to give you an idea of the, of the size of it. Uh, so it's got uh, an antenna snapped into the front of it, 16 element antenna. You can see that each card controls uh, uh, four elements in a row of that antenna. And uh, data and power comes to each card via this little 10 pin ribbon cable. Okay, so that was a little bit of background on the X microwave system and uh, where that ADR1000 board comes from and how we put it together into that, what we call the phased array cube. So now let's talk about how we make all the connections so that we can send and receive data, we can, we can plot the data, and we can control the ADR1000. This is kind of an overview of what that setup looks like. On the, on the very right-hand side, um, you see this uh, HP100. We'll talk about that later, but it's just this uh, very cheap, very portable 10.5 gigahertz RF source. And that, uh, that will just shine down onto this 16 element phased array panel here that's connected to the phased array cube. And then you can see those four ADR1000 cards there. They'll all get summed together. Uh, they'll go through SMA cables and then get uh, summed together with a four to one combiner and then go through the LTC5552 mixer uh, which is going to mix down to something in the range of Pluto, so something less than six gigahertz. We're using the transmit port of Pluto uh, to provide an LO. That's just not really how you would normally do it, but it's it's quick and easy, and uh, it makes for a, a simple setup. We'll use Pluto then as kind of like an RF detector, and we'll we'll gather data. We'll run FFTs on it on the Raspberry Pi, and we can plot what the signal response is as we as we change the beam weights of each of the eight or one thousands. And then on that Raspberry Pi, we'll be running the Pi ADI IAO Python library that's going to control both Pluto and all the ADR 1000s. There's a crude breakout board that I had to make for the Raspberry Pi. Um, it, it, it brings all four of those wiring harnesses together that go to each of the individual ADR 1000 cards and uh, just brings it to the Raspberry Pi interface. Um, it's, it, it looks worse than it really is. It's just a lot of wires going to the SPI Zero port on the Raspberry Pi. And then in the lower right-hand corner is where 5.5 uh, volts in ground uh, comes into the system, and that, and that also gets sent out to the phase three cube. And finally, this is that HP100 RF source. It's a 10.5 gigahertz source with a little patch antenna connected to it. Uh, you can find these on Amazon, eBay, or DigiKey. And it makes for just a very easy way to uh, generate uh, an RF signal that we can then track with our phase array. Then this is how the whole system looks when we put it together. You can see the phased array cube at the top. It has four SMA cables going to the four to one combiner that goes to the mixer and then just uh, connected directly to the Pluto. And then to the left, you can see the Raspberry Pi with its wiring harness that supplies data and power to the phased array cube. Okay, so that was all the hardware and all the connections for that hardware. The next thing that we're gonna wanna do is to download uh, all the software and make sure that that's installed properly. The easiest way to do that is to simply download the ADI Kuiper Linux distribution. That comes all as one giant file. It has all the device drivers, everything in there. You could download everything separately, but it's just nice to have it all, all in one spot. You download it to an SD card and we'll be ready to go. Then we'll need to add an overlay to the Raspberry Pi's device tree. Um, the device tree just tells the Linux operating system what hardware is connected to it. And so we'll have to make sure that it recognizes both the Pluto and the ADR1000 devices. And then finally, there's some easy ways that we can check the installation and make sure that everything is ready for our next step, which is when we run the Python script. This is the page where you can download ADI's Kuiper Linux. It includes pretty much everything you need to interact with a large number of analog devices, parts, and development boards. Um, it's going to include all the device drivers and the device tree overlays, overlays uh, IO oscilloscope, which is a very valuable tool for these drivers, um, and all the Python libraries. So you can just scroll down and find the latest version and then just download the SD card image file here. The site also has other great information on writing the SD card image, setting up the device tree overlay, and then um, testing to see what devices are installed. Uh, and we're gonna go through those steps next. So I've written the image that we just downloaded to an SD card, and I placed that SD card in my Raspberry Pi 4. 
And now we need to add the device tree overlay uh, to access the ADA 1000. If it asks for a password, password is analog. That's the default, you can change it. And here's what the config.txt file looks like. And uh, we just scroll down and we can add in the device tree overlay for the ADA 1000. And then we save that. Okay, while we're waiting for that Raspberry Pi to reboot, let's take a look at the device tree that we just added into the Raspberry Pi. You can find the device tree on Analog Devices GitHub site. I've put the link right there. So I'm certainly not a device tree expert. Let me just point out a couple of things though on the device tree. You can see that we're using SPI bus zero on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, this red zero here refers to the chip select that we're using, chip select zero to control the four ADAR 1000s. You can see those four ADAR 1000s listed here as ADAR 1000 zero, one, two, and three. They're each given a different label, beam zero, beam one, beam two, and beam three. And these register addresses correspond to the setting of the address uh, pins, the address zero and address one pins. So uh, reg of zero means that um, the address pins are set to zero, zero. This means they're set to zero, one. This means they're set to one, zero. And this means they are uh, set to one, one. So these are the external settings of the address pins on the ADAR 1000. They are tied high or tied low by external resistors. Okay, the Raspberry Pi has rebooted, and now we can check to see if uh, we have the right devices connected up. And the way we can do that is by the IO info command, IO info dash S for scan. And we see that we do find the Pluto device. This is plugged in via USB. And then we also find the four ADAR 1000 devices that make up the phased array cube. These don't necessarily have to be plugged into the spy ports in order for them to be discovered um, with the ioinfo-s command, uh, but, the, but the Pluto device does. Next, let's test to make sure that we have the right libraries installed. And to do that, I launched this Thani program, not the most powerful IDE, but, um, but good enough. So once Thani launches, we can then uh, just make sure that we can import uh, the Python libraries that we're going to need, uh, import ADI, and that should return without any errors, and then import IAO. Uh, so those both return without any errors. If you did get an error when you tried to import these, uh, probably your path is set up wrong. That is that Python can't find where they've been installed. It should work out of the box here, but um, probably your path, or perhaps um, if you did your own driver installation, maybe something, some, you forgot to install something. So check to make sure that those two are installed. And with that, we are ready now to do a true Python example. All right, so let's start up our basic Python IDE, Thani. Password is analog if it asks you for one. Okay. Um, this main file here is the one that I'm going to be using. I'm not going to post this anywhere. It's still a little bit of a work in progress, but I'll post a link to where a very similar file is for the in the Pi ADI IIO examples folder, and uh, you, and you can use that and and basically do the same thing. The other files here, the Pluto config, uh, Pi ADI uh, functions, and STR functions. These are just different uh, different libraries that are not terribly important. They're probably covered in other videos better, but, um, they basically just access Pi ADI and, uh, and Pluto. So we're just going to import a bunch of libraries. Uh, most of this is for plotting. And, uh, of course we import our ADI library that has both the ADR 1000 and the Pluto objects in there. Okay, the most important piece of this file is in this description right here of setting our array objects. So let's spend some time dissecting this because this is going to make all the rest of the programming uh, so, so easy. Okay, so we are creating an array object and it's an array of several ADAR 1000s. These, these are going to be mapped out in our device map. Each ADAR 1000 corresponds to a device number 
And each of these device numbers, device one corresponds to beam zero, device two corresponds to beam one, et cetera. These labels here, beam zero, beam one, beam two, beam three, that's what we saw in the device tree. So these must match exactly what is in the device tree. The key here, and what we want to do is we want to map the elements to individual ADAR 1000 channels such that we never have to think again about the which ADAR 1000 we're talking to or which channel number we're talking to. We only think about things in terms of what element number it is um, and in terms of what row and column it's in. So let me let me pull up a picture of how this looks for our setup. Okay. So this is our setup here. I've arbitrarily chosen the element number to start here in the upper left-hand corner, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So four elements per ADAR1000 card. And the ADAR1000 cards are arranged such that the address zero is beam zero. And this was defined in the device tree and also by the, via the resistor selection on the ADAR1000. Uh, the next ADAR1000 is called beam one, and it has four channels, five through eight. Uh, the next ADAR1000 is after that is beam two, and then the next one is beam three. So we've assigned these element numbers. Now we want to match each element number to the correct ADAR1000 beam and to the correct channel. And once we do this, we never have to think about this again. From now on, after this, we'll just address elements by their either their element number or by their row and column number. And this is makes the rest of the programming uh, very nice. Okay, but let's go through how we set this up. This is essentially the only thing that, that you really have to think about. So element one, this element here, maps to channel three of beam zero. Beam zero is device one. Device one is right here. Channel three is the third element over, one, two, three. And you can see that that is indeed uh, element one. So element one goes to device one um, of the third, its third channel, channel number three. Okay, let me, let's do another example um, just to um, further illustrate. Let's look at element 10. So element 10, we've arbitrarily assigned it to be right here, element 10. Element 10 is beam number two under channel four. So element 10, beam number two is device three, device three, channel number four, one, two, three, four, and that's, that's why we put 10 there. 10 is the element number there. Okay, hopefully that makes sense now. You can see the mapping between the ADR1000 devices, the elements that we arbitrarily assign, and then uh, the channels for each of the ADR1000 devices. Now that we have our channels and element numbers all set up, it's very easy to just cycle through each of the four ADAR1000 cards and we can initialize them. We can set their mode to the receive mode. We can uh, now let's just cycle through all of the elements, um, all 16 of our elements. We can set the receive and transmit gains to 127. We latch in those settings here. And then we can do a sweep and look how easy it is to do this sweep now. We can sweep the steering angle and elevation from minus 80 degrees to 80 degrees in three degree steps and sweep the azimuth in, again from minus 80 to 80 degrees in three degree steps. So we steer, steer um, the receive in both azimuth and elevation. Again, this is handled by the um, uh, ADAR 1000 array object. We latch in those settings, and then we create an array that includes the elevation angle, azimuth angle, and then the array gain. The array gain is, is achieved 
by grabbing a buffer of data from Pluto and then computing the DBFS. There's some other videos that I have on my channel that show you how to do that, so we won't go over them here. We'll skip the transmit side because we're not doing that. And then the rest of this is just different ways to plot the data. Uh, there's lots of great YouTube tutorials on how to do 3D plots in Matplotlib. So we can run this. And before I show you the graphs that that uh, Python script generates, let me uh, sh show you a live view of our ADAR1000 setup here. There's the uh, ADAR1000 X microwave cube. And uh, we can adjust the angle on that to, to get different uh, azimuths and elevations. And then to the left is the HB100. That's our expand microwave source. So for this first run, I'm just going to put the HB100 directly in front of the X microwave cube. So the azimuth and steering angles should both be pretty close to zero degrees. And here's the plots that we generated. I did forge kind of different versions of the same data, just plotted in different ways. Uh, let's look at each of those plots now. This first plot is just a black and white plot. It's the easiest one for the Raspberry Pi to redraw. I'm doing all of this uh, on directly on the Raspberry Pi for itself. And uh, some of these 3D images take, take a bit um, of processing power. So this is the easiest one to kind of manipulate and, and roll around. I'm using the matplotlib uh, plot surface uh, command. But you can see here, we see the side lobes. We see the azimuth and elevation centered at right around zero degrees. That's where our peak response is. And here's the next plot we can look at. Again, this is all the same data. Um, we've just now applied some color to the gain. A little bit harder for our Raspberry Pi 4 to redraw this and, and keep up with it. And here's a top-down view of uh, what this looks like. So this kind of kind of better highlights uh, where our peaks and side lobes are. And now let's rotate our phased array cube about 30 degrees in the azimuth direction. Then we can rerun our Python script and see if we see a, a similar shift of about 30 degrees in the response plots. Here's what those plots look like. I'll zoom in on one and you can see that it has indeed shifted by, by about 30 degrees. And then our peak response is at an azimuth of 30 degrees and an elevation of zero. And that will basically conclude this overview of the ADAR1000 X microwave phased array cube. Um, I hope that was helpful. And please leave a comment if you have any questions or need any additional help. Thank you.